Hi everyone, uh, today I will be talking about uh, the PyTorch profiler and also dive into the efficiency and the sustainability aspects a little bit. So we'll start off by looking at the GPU performance tuning as it is very relevant for this uh, talk and then dive into the PyTorch profiler, uh, look at how timeline tracing is done and walk you through some of the optimization examples. And then a uh, really exciting topic about the future, uh, how we can move towards sustainable AI. So for many people, when they shift from uh, like running their models or training them on CPUs to GPUs, it requires a very different kind of a mindset and thinking because in the case of CPUs, you typically have uh, processes which are optimized for a single thread performance, but on the GPU side, uh, GPUs achieve high throughput via massive parallelism. So it is very easy to underestimate the uh, parallelism required to keep your GPUs busy. And uh, this can be a surprisingly challenging task and it can take you quite a bit of time to develop a good uh, intuition about this. So if you take a look at a GPU behind the scenes, uh, GPUs are composed of what is called the streaming multiprocessors. So these are the functional units operating in parallel on the elements of some segment of the input data. And uh, if you compare it to the CPUs, so this is the, the streaming uh, multiprocessors are the closest thing to a CPU core. And uh, if you see a DGX system, you will notice that it has almost 8x more uh, SMs compared to how many CPU cores you have on the system. And if you zoom in into a streaming multiprocessor, you will see that it is mostly filled up with the functional units. And it has many more functional units uh, compared to a CPU core, thousands of FP, 32 units for a single GPU. And now with the newer GPUs, you will also start to see more of uh, FP16 and uh, int uh, uh, units as well. So the, some of the common pitfalls when you migrate to GPUs from CPUs, uh, include excessive uh, CPU to GPU interactions. So, so for example, if you're lo looping through a launching operation on the GPUs, uh, you know, so this can be one example where it's doing a lot of back and forth between the CPU and the GPU. Uh, similarly, uh, if your GPU kernels are very short, uh, for example, you're handling uh, processing many small inputs. So you could be going uh, like back and forth and you will need a lot of data to keep all the GPU threads busy. Yeah, other uh, bottlenecks include uh, if you have uh, CPU overheads or IO bottlenecks where the GPU is just waiting for the IO to be, the data to be loaded. So that can be starving the GPU. So that's another source of uh, inefficiency. And then finally, in your uh, framework or your model code itself, uh, there can be uh, inefficiencies. Uh, you could be you know, unknowingly copying data, for example, from CPU to GPU every time, if you are just uh, saving your tensors, for example, and that can uh, incur additional costs. So visibility is really very important. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we have uh, built the PyTorch profiler. Uh, so we had this as a tool internally inside Meta, and we ended up open sourcing it uh, jointly with uh, Microsoft. Uh, so this was launched uh, towards the start of the year, I would say, back with the PyTorch 1.8 release. Uh, it gives you a common way to get to your PyTorch and GPU level information all in one place. You, it does the automatic uh, bottleneck detection, gives you actionable recommendations, and gives you very user-friendly uh, tools, you know, so a data scientist can embed it inside their VS code, or just look at the TensorBoard profiler uh, UI to see all the results and uh, get the recommendations and very easily to instrument in your model code and use it. So behind the scenes, uh, it is powered by the PyTorch profiler API and that sits in the new Kinito library, which is in the PyTorch uh, source tree. So PyTorch slash Kinito 
that's where you'll find the code for this. And it is all powered through the CUPT interface uh, from NVIDIA. So at a basic level, if you take a look at the PyTorch, uh, the profiling API, you start off by importing the Torch profiler and then you set up the profiling context and you run your code. And finally, you can print the results. And what you see on the right-hand side is an output of what that uh, print uh, looks like. And we have uh, many good recipes and examples on the pytorch.org site uh, that you can look for reference. So this is if you were just using the API and printing the output on the command line. Now, when you integrate it with the TensorBoard uh, plugin, uh, you will install the TensorBoard plugin, which is a pip install, a separate pip install. And then again, you know, you'll do the same import Torch profiler. Uh, now, in your profiling context, you just need to do this uh, extra step of uh, saving this, uh, you know, the on-trace handler and specifying that it should use this uh, TensorBoard trace handler and where to save the results. So that's the only extra step that is needed. And then this will generate a trace file, which you can visualize in the uh, TensorBoard uh, plugin. So this is some of the outputs of what you will see in the uh, TensorBoard profiler. So there is this nice uh, kernel level view overview. You can see all the timeline traces in detail and uh, many more views to navigate. Now for the advanced features, uh, you can now control many things from this uh, profiling API. For example, you can decide you know, when to trigger the profiling part. Uh, you don't want to do, be doing it on every step. Maybe you want to do it uh, after every six uh, iterations, after the model has gone through some warm up time, or you want to do some initial waiting initially, so you can control all of that. So you can decide you know, how many steps you want to profile, which activities you want to profile. Do you want to just do it for CPU or GPU activities? And uh, you can have a callable handler for saving the results. You can also decide whether you want to profile extra data, for example, record the shapes, uh, log the stack, uh, the memory, and for the output, you can decide what should be the uh, output type, uh, like uh, output option. Do you, do you want just a Chrome tracing or you want the TensorBoard or other output formats? So this here is an example of uh, invoking the TensorBoard uh, profiler from the VS Code integration. So when you launch it uh, from there, you will get this feature for jump to source code. So in the profiler traces, when you see the uh, source code traces, if you just click on that, it will directly take you to the line of the code in the source, so very handy. This is an example of what a distributed training view looks like. So when you are training your model on multi-GPU uh, nodes, you, know, you can get all the insights about, is there an imbalance across the different GPUs? What are the overheads on the nickel, the communication side? Uh, in the new PyTorch, the 1.10 release that just came out, we added support for glue as well. So you can get all the details at the, uh, for the distributed training uh, and uh, optimize your uh, training runs. And another interesting feature is this, uh, on the VS Code side, our data wrangler has been added. So if you're using the, uh, PyTorch uh, Python uh, plugin with VS Code. It comes with the context sensitive help for PyTorch and it has these uh, nice uh, data wrangling features where you can do the analysis like this histogram analysis of the data set that you are trying to use in your model. And there are many interesting cool features like this uh, added uh, recently to the VS Code uh, Python uh, plugin. Now let's dive into the timeline tracing. So this is what uh, the timeline trace uh, typically looks like for you know, tracing the CPU and the GPU activities. So you will see this uh, different threads on the CPU side and for the GPU, all the streams, you will see the different streams. And at the bottom, you will see all the details. 
and there you see these arrows so these are you know the the relationships how they are linked together so you can see those so this is what an actual output looks like uh, so this is the chrome tracer view uh, which is built into the tensorboard plugin and you can see here uh, you know all the the actual record functions that you had used to annotate and the actual uh, operations from the cpu to the gpu So the with record function is what you use for annotating. So here you see the forward, uh, forward with the uh, like uh, TW embed lookup, et cetera. So this is what you put in the code and then you get all the details uh, below that. So very easy to uh, navigate and you can leave these record functions permanently on. They have a very low performance uh, overhead. So one feature that is uh, easy to uh, miss is you know, how to get these uh, CUDA activities. So you can click on the CUDA activity and look at then at the bottom with the arrow, like from the CPU launch, how it went to the GPU execution and uh, see the full details of it. You know, what was the uh, start time? What was the, you know, the views of the categories? You can get the detail level of uh, GPU kernels used, uh, et cetera, in the, bottom view, the stack view at the bottom. Uh, another interesting feature is that, uh, you know, when you click on this GPU activity, you can see the additional details, like what is the actual SM utilization. So normally like people use the NVIDIA SMI to sh show the utilization, but it doesn't give you at the individual operation level utilization. So, uh, you know, for your entire model training, it may be giving you an indication that 86% utilization is there. But when you dive into the actual kernels, you will see that the uh, SM utilization is actually much lower. So there is a lot more room for optimizations. Uh, so you can get those details uh, from this uh, from trace view. Okay. So this particular is an example, like, you know, the previous one after optimizations. Uh, so this, you know, this was by increasing the request path size. And now you can see the SM utilization has gone up uh, much higher. So now let's dive into some of the examples uh, of these optimizations using the trace analysis. So these are from so, some real workloads. Uh, running for model training inside uh, Meta. So one common entry pattern when you move to GPUs is that often you will encounter scenarios where your GPU is idle for a long time, and it is very difficult to figure out why the GPU is idle. So this uh, inactivity can be easily discovered by adding the record functions. So you saw those hash hash, uh, you know, the uh, functions, so once you add that, that will surface you where the bottlenecks are on the CPU side, and it will help you parallelize the CPU operations and do more of an overlap between the CPU and the GPU operations. Another uh, uh, anti-pattern is the excessive interaction between the CPU and the GPU. So in this particular example, the exponential moving average hook function was originally written in the uh, Python code. So it was using a for loop. So it was the CPU was the bottleneck. And when on rewriting that same function using the PyTorch uh, for each loop, the loop was now executed on the GPU side. And this uh, EMA hook uh, got uh, 100x faster by doing all these uh, operations on the GPU versus on the CPU, the back and forth on the CPU. Another anti pattern uh, related to this was this uh, optimization step for the RMS prop. Uh, so in the PyTorch side, we have this uh, torch for each function. So by using that uh, torch for each, uh, you can use it now for multi-tensor and uh, everything will then happen on the GPU side. And in the traces, you can see there's a huge difference between the previous version and the new version where previous version, you will see a lot of these uh, CPU, GPU operations going back and forth. 
whereas in the new version it is all happening uh, you know in chunks and uh, this by just making this change we got another 12x uh, uh, speed up then the third issue is uh, that i want to highlight is this from another one of our training runs where we had a lot of forward and backward passes uh, dominated by the sync patch norm function so here the model had about uh, 84x uh, sync batch norms in the forward pass and then there was a 3x uh, overhead in the nickel all gather for each sync patch norm and another 2x on the each of the nickel all reduce so this was uh, optimized by you know like uh, making these changes and uh, we got a speed up of uh, in the forward pass we got a speed up of 1.5x and in the backward pass we got a speed up of 1.3 seconds so this here is a case study where we helped uh, one of our customers to optimize their nlp models so originally when they came to us uh, and they shared the initial version of the model it was uh, running 2.4 requests per second uh, so very low throughput and we were able to go through the different optimization steps uh, by uh, looking at the profiler output and running a whole bunch of experiments and get it optimized to uh, 1.4k requests per second and with this they were able to meet their sla for uh, this uh, real-time use case where they wanted each inference to happen in under 20 milliseconds so this particular example or originally we started off by doing the optimizations on the cpu side uh, but uh, due to their low sla we then switched over to gpu uh, inferencing and we uh, employed a number of techniques to optimize like model dot half uh, switching to a distal bird based uh, version of the model, increasing the batch size, uh, making sure we were not doing any over padding and all the inputs uh, were of the same length, uh, and also experimenting with the NVIDIA's uh, faster transformer. Similar to this, we did another case study with a customer for an offline uh, batch inference scenario where their original inference pipeline was processing 46 million documents in 21 days when they came to us. And by going through the different optimization techniques, we were able to bring it down to two days. Uh, so as you can see, you know, like uh, these optimizations can uh, speed up things drastically uh, for you, uh, a load of the cost, uh, especially this is very important as the growth of the AI models is increasing. So deep learning is witnessing an exponential growth in the data on the model parameters in the system resources that are being used. So thousand X model sizes have uh, increased, uh, which is leading to a higher model accuracy for the different ML tasks. So if we take an example of the GPT-3 model, to increase the model quality, the blue score from 5 to 40 required the model to be 1000x larger in size. Uh, so, so, you know, we are seeing throughout Meta similar growth on our recommender models, uh, same thing on our language models. So overall, the trend is, you know, greater model, models with larger sizes, more data, more number of models. We are not able to keep up with all the requirements on our infrastructure. Uh, so not just on being able to run these models, but also from a power consumption uh, perspective. So if you take a look at the power consumption aspects for these uh, models across the different phases, uh, if you see the end-to-end -end life cycle, so from the data to the experimentation, training and inference. So we are observing like uh, across our fleet, uh, roughly the power capacity breakdown is uh, 10 to 20 to 70 for the uh, AI infrastructure devoted to the experimentation, training and inference side. And uh, we are expecting that uh, this will, the demand will continue to grow 
you know, exponentially year over year. So we have to, uh, you know, spin up megawatts of uh, new power capacity for our new data centers as we are uh, building these and similar challenges are there for all the cloud providers. And uh, at a smaller scale, every company that is running these models is facing the high cost of training these models and it is putting a lot of burden on the overall infrastructure. So taking a look at some of the optimizations that we are now putting in place for our uh, language models, keeping in mind the carbon footprint. Uh, so this here is an example of the types of optimizations that we have done for the large scale uh, language model tasks. So by first we started by adding more of caching. Uh, so things that can be like, especially for inferencing. Uh, so if the inference can be reused uh, just by doing this platform level caching, even with CPUs, we were able to get uh, 6.7X uh, improvements. Uh, earlier, most of the models at Meta used to run, uh, the inferencing used to run on CPUs. Now we have started adding support for GPUs uh, for the inference side as well. So with the GPU acceleration, we unlocked another 10.1X uh, uh, energy efficiency. And then finally, the last set of optimizations were through the algorithmic optimizations where we got the 10X uh, improvements. And the figure that you see on the right-hand side, it gives you the overall, you know, the operational carbon footprint of these uh, large language models. So you see the LM is the language model, RM are the different recommender models uh, inside uh, Meta, or our new company name. And then on the right hand side, you see some of the examples of the open source large scale language models. Uh, so this here is only the for the training footprint. For the uh, meta Facebook models, we have both uh, data for the inference and the training side. So as you move towards the thinking about what do you need to do to build models that are having a lower impact on the environment, uh, it requires a very different kind of a mindset. Uh, so you need to be thinking about uh, looking at, you know, the end-to-end -end life cycle, starting from the data utilization efficiency. So think about, you know, the data scaling, sampling, can you sample, do you need to use all the data? Is the data life uh, over time, uh, uh, reducing, diminishing. So you have to think about things like data perishability become important. So as an example, in the case of the natural language uh, models, we see that data sets can lose the half of their predictive value in the time period of uh, less than seven years. So there's no point of keeping the data for a long time if that is the case for your scenario. So you should assess uh, things like uh, perishability. Other techniques that are on the experimentation and training efficiency side include uh, experimentation with NAS, hyperparameter optimization, uh, not just doing a single objective optimization, but doing a multi-objective optimization uh, to get better results, uh, make use of better model architectures, which are uh, resource efficient. Uh, and then uh, taking into account the full infrastructure side of the house, so uh, how to think about uh, efficient, uh, scalable environmental uh, infrastructure, uh, new types of techniques can be employed uh, where we are working with some of the cloud providers on how to get to a carbon efficient scheduling. So a green uh, resource aware scheduler, which will uh, do your training in a region of a cloud which is powered by local uh, green energy versus the, you know, the traditional uh, energy. You can also employ techniques like doing uh, using federated learning where part of the training is happening on device. So by splitting the training on the cloud and on the device, uh, you're able to get some uh, carbon uh, you know, energy efficiency savings as well. And you can, you can get uh, better results. And uh, in, so the 
call to action for the industry is you know how we can move towards adoption of uh, better telemetry so first start off by measuring and uh, publishing the results uh, so we are working with the different uh, uh, research conferences and different platforms and how we can start to publish the carbon impact statements and especially in the model cards as these uh, research papers are published. So here I wanted to highlight one startup which is really doing it very well. So Cohere.ai is a startup uh, that is, uh, you know, if you go to their website, they already have an environmental impact statement. And for all their models, they are publishing, uh, you know, what is the, uh, carbon impact for the different sizes of their models uh, and compare it in terms of uh, transatlantic flight as well to make it uh, easily be understandable. So here are some resources for you to get started. On the PyTorch profiler side, we are working with uh, Microsoft now to add a better way of reporting this uh, energy usage. Uh, so in the next version, hopefully we'll have uh, better tools uh, to, for you to be able to quickly measure and uh, also uh, publish the environmental impact of your model training. I will open it up for questions now. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, sorry, Karen, did you want me to jump into the questions or did you, was there? Sure, uh, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, Denny. I was just looking uh, to see see what questions I... Uh... No problem. So, perfect, perfect. Well, then, hey, Gita, for starters, thank you very much for this great presentation. So let's just jump right into it, because we have a few questions in terms of uh, more just to get people up and running, okay? So, for example, one of the first things you did call out is that the, the idea of looking at GPU and CPU profile recordings. Right. So for folks that are just starting out, what, what do you think are the first steps to taking advantage of reading and learning from the CPU GPU recordings? I mean, you, you, you've called out, obviously, the potential carbon impact, which we will definitely get into in a, with a few questions as well. But how about just for like, you know, without going that far ahead, right? Just like how do you how do people get to learn and utilize and and be effective by understanding these uh, these particular set of telemetry or, or metrics? Yeah, so a great starting point would be to look at the PyTorch uh, recipes, uh, so profiler recipes. So the steps that I showed at the start of the uh, presentation start with the basic usage. Just start by you know setting the profiler context and printing uh, so that you get start to get an awareness of how uh, you know where exactly uh, you know what is the uh, CPU overheads, what are the GPU overheads, how much uh, resources are being used on the memory front. So you start to get an intuition about it. Uh, so start with the API. Uh, for those of you who are more visual oriented, uh, look at the TensorBoard plugin. It gives you very good uh, views to navigate through all of this data uh, with charts and all which make it easy to digest. We have a ton of great uh, blogs and resources. So if you, I'll, we'll, we'll be sharing the slides so you can take a look at the resources from this presentation uh, that should help you to get started. Perfect, we've got some questions coming in from LinkedIn right now. So let me go ahead and just dive into it right away. So Fehu from, um, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Fei, by the way, um, uh, from Microsoft, he did ask the question, is there a way to run the profiler without changing any of the code? For example, just add some parameters to a command. So we don't have that at present, but that is one of the features that has been in uh, high demand. So we are working on uh, on-demand uh, uh, profiler, which doesn't require any kind of instrumentation. So either, uh, so hopefully we'll have some of these features available in the next version of PyTorch uh, 1.11 coming out in the first week of uh, March. Oh, that's excellent to hear actually. That's uh, the the faster we can, the easier we can make it, the, it's a lot lower likely we're actually gonna start making use of those yes. commands that you have to admit. Okay, um, and the second question from Faye as well is, uh, Fei Hu, is, uh, is the PyTorch profiler compatible with the CUDA graph? Uh, 
can they like do they have some more uh, details uh, so are they looking for more like the full CUDA graph output in the profiler uh, so I, I believe that's the implication of the question. I mean, like, if that's the bad thing when we have to do these LinkedIn type conversations where <laughs> there is a there is a minute long delay. So for for Faye, if you can pro, if you can um, provide additional context, that'd be great. But um, yeah, I mean, let, let's just presume that. You know, let's go with that as your question. Yeah, for now. <laughs> so we are adding more support uh, for more features. So at present, you get all the GPU kernel level views. And you can see all the input output shapes and you can get the full trace. Uh, other features, you know, we, with each version of the profiler, we are adding new things. So I would encourage them to open a GitHub issue. And, uh, you know, once it gets uploaded, uh, we will definitely review that and see how to prioritize that feature. Makes a ton of sense. Okay, I'm going to clarify to some more of the, especially near the tail end of your discussion, some interesting concepts that you brought up, which is like, for starters, this idea of perishability. So, so when you're talking about perishability, you're, are you really focusing on the model perishability or even the data perishability? From your so context? this was uh, for the data perishability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would encourage you to read our paper, which I linked up in the talk. Uh, so, so basically, like, sometimes... Uh, so at present, if you see most companies, uh, when we are building the uh, AI uh, ML models, we are collecting this data and this data is like uh, there lives for a long time. But there are many scenarios where the patterns change. So if you take a look at the retail examples you know, with COVID-19, the buying pattern of how people buy things online or in the stores has completely changed. So if you were just hanging on to that years of data and trying to do the predictions based on the historical trends, that would not have worked in this whole period, right? So in this particular scenario, your data is already stale. Uh, it helps you in having some context uh, for doing your model predictions, but uh, with this stale data, if you are storing the stale data for a long time, you have to be thinking in the future, what is the cost of the storage as well? Uh, so that's where the data perishability aspects come into play. Oh, perfect, perfect. That actually is very helpful. Um, and so then there's another great question. So for companies that are, whether they're starting out or they're getting closer to actually having machine learning maturity, do you have any suggestions of what you should do from like, you know, from a caching or sharing perspective, right? You know, there's a lot of buzz about feature stores. You know, is there anything you can share about how you and your company, Meta, you know, approaches that inference caching? I think, actually. So inference caching can start very simple. Actually, it doesn't. So feature store is uh, different from inference uh, caching. So feature store is more uh, when you are, uh, you know, like using it in your, like more, more often utilized on the model training side. Uh, whereas caching of the inference is, let's say you are predicting the price of a particular good uh, and it price changes on a daily basis. So you don't need to be running this particular inference every time a request to your model is sent. You can cache, pre-cache it, like you can compute these values at night or you know, like the first time such a request comes, and cache it for the entire duration of the day. And people who are coming from the traditional web development side, they're already familiar with all these caching techniques. So, you know, have your data scientists work with your uh, software engineers and combine the techniques from both sides. So caching, people use it heavily on traditional web architecture. So use the same techniques on the model uh, prediction side as well. Perfect. I think that actually does cover all the questions for, uh, from LinkedIn and YouTube today. So, um, Karen, I think uh, we're probably really good to go. Anything else we should do before we segue? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Perfect timing, Denny. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Gita, thank you very much. We're going to switch over now to the second portion of this show. Um, and in this case, it'll be a fireside chat between myself and Scott. Uh, it is The title of it is Designing Evolutionary Data Systems. There's a lot of... Um, 
implications with that. So if we, so before I go really into it, Scott, why don't you start off? Uh, by the way, you need to unmute yourself, my friend, um, and go ahead and uh, provide some context uh, of who you are, what your background is, and that'll probably allow us to clue into folks what we mean by the design of de de designing evolutionary data systems. Yeah. <clears throat> So my name is Scott Haynes, and um, I'm a senior principal software engineer at Twilio, um, which is a, a communications and data company now. Um, and so I, I think like in general, um, like evolutionary data systems, like I like to talk about it as like, where do people, like, where do you start out and what steps do you take to, you know, complete the journey that, you know, gets to, you know, having an architecture like what, you know, what's inside of Meta. We don't know what's inside of there. You know, as an outsider, I don't know what runs in there, but, you know, you can kind of think about like, what are, what are the steps that are needed? What are the, you know, si like the systems that are needed to be able to, you know, run at scale and be able to actually, you know, um, you know, ha handle, you know, handle, you know, uncertainty um, and, you know, the unknown unknowns without having to kind of like, you know, derail feature roadmaps and things like that. Um, so a lot of times, like, you know, if you think about, you know, going all in on a specific, you know, technology or going all in on, you know, a specific, you know, a way of doing things, a lot of times, like by the time you get out the door with that, it's already time for change again. Um, and so for a lot of times, like evolutions, you know, they happen more often than like, you know, um, a, a guy that I work with, this guy, Krister, talks about how like evolutions happen more frequently than revolution. And a lot of times evolutions are the natural pattern to, you know, a new, you know, data revolution, let's call it for this, you know, for this concept. Um, so basically, essentially, it's, you know, what components are necessary, like what building blocks are next, uh, necessary to be able to build, you know, build a system that can scale. And also, you know, kind of going back to what Gita was talking about with like data perishability, like there's certain things that eventually fall off the wagon and it's okay to let those things go. Like, you know, you think about, you know, it's like, I don't know, early on, like early on career wise, I was not good at letting go, right? It's like the whole, like the frozen analogy, right? It's like, you know, just let it go, whatever. I think that's the song. I, I now I'm like- it, it, it actually very much is. I yes. have a four-year-old daughter that sings that song all the time. So Excellent. yes, yes, it, so yes, it is. I think yeah. that's like a good thing in general to think about. Yeah. Like, you know, don't don't hold on to things and hoard the things that worked in the past. Um, you know, very much like what Gita was talking about with like, you know, the 50%, you know, um, like, you know, 50% decay over a seven year period for data. The same thing happens within like a two year, two to three year cycle for, you know, components within like a data platform. Um, so evolutionary systems are, you know, replacing things while still maintaining a product that's in production, that's running at like an enterprise scale without disrupting everything. Um, because it's a lot easier to disrupt than it is to, you know, to create. Right. So, and then one thing I think that we definitely want to call out is that the basis of the context of this conversation we're about to have is very much this idea of working with data at scale, right? That that concept is hard. And because it's hard that we actually have to over simple, we have to not over, excuse me, we have to simplify things so that we, we can break them down into smaller components that are less likely to go ahead and actually break under heavy, under heavy strain or heavy load. And by the way, um, I forgot to properly introduce myself. My name is Denny. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks. I'm a, I'm a longtime data guy myself. I was, worked with the SQL Server team before and uh, introduced uh, help was on the, excuse me, the infrastructure team for um, um, the prototype team, excuse me, for what is now known as HD Insight. And I've been a longtime Brickster as well. So the conversation Scott and I are going to have for the next 30 minutes or so, I guess. And please ask questions either on LinkedIn, Zoom, or by uh, YouTube uh, in the interim. I'll do my best to go ahead and look at those questions and then ask them in, 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 is to basically discuss about these concepts. So well, we're going to break this down into basically a four-part section. So we're going to start with the idea of first steps, what to do with the data. The second step, connecting the dots. Now, what do you do actually do with the data? The third step, methods for looking at your data problem. And then finally, the decision-making, the road to actionable data. Okay, so that's more or less the framework we're going to probably uh, follow under. So, Scott, diving into this initially, let's let's talk about those first steps. Like, what are you supposed to do with this data? Like, let's take the part in time when you first joined Twilio or any other organization for that matter that you've managed and run. Like, you're typically given this problem where like, okay, you've got a bunch of data, yay. What are you gonna do, do, do with it? What, what, is, what is the first things that come to mind that you actually have to help address? Yeah, so I think, I think like in general, um, like there was this, if you think about data being like, you know, there's an atomic unit of something, 
like data encapsulates, you know, an event, a metric, you know, an observation in a system generally. Um, you know, data can be anything. Like there's this whole kind of notion of like, if you think about like, you know, early on, like when you're learning computer science, you learn about like an abstract bag. Data is an abstract bag. It, can, it literally can be anything, but it can also be, you know, something that is, you know, kind of future proof in terms of what the data is, or it can be something that, you know, very quickly kind of corrupts over time. And like, you know, if you think about like, you know, schemas and having, you know, binary serializable data, like there's this whole notion of like, you know, you can create, you can create a lot of systems based off of like, you know, semi-structured data, like CSV or JSON, but like over time, like, you know, if you are, you know, if you're collecting that data, because it's so, you know, subject to change, um, there's this, you know, will you be able to continue to, you know, use data that you originally captured? Um, does it make sense for that data to go away? And, you know, is it encapsulating like a thought? And is it something that can also be, you know, reused for, for anything else as well? Like, I know it's kind of an, an abstract, like, you know, kind of generally data in general should be able to be reused if you're going to capture it. Um, but, you know, there's a whole side tangent about, you know, many different things we could go from, you know, from here, but just in general, like everything starts with just the data. And if you don't understand what it is that you want to capture and you have kind of, you know, a fuzzy idea of what you need to do, like there's, you know, it's much better to go through an experiment, um, with, you know, a very kind of, you know, uh, you know, cheap, cheaper data structure, like something like a JSON or a CSV to understand like, you know, what, what what am I trying to accomplish? And then, you know, go out and take a look at what actually is currently already available. Like, I think it, it you know, a lot of it depends on like, you know, the stage of the company is in. Um, so, you know, being, you know, having been at startups where we, there's absolutely no data, we have no data. Like the only data we really might have is like, you know, what's, what's coming in for free from like, say Google analytics, um, for example. Um, but, you know, having to make that, you know, early decision as like, you know, what is it that we should capture? I, I think is something that, sometimes gets glanced over like at, you know, at, you know, depends on the company and whether or not they have like kind of good data maturity yet. Um, but I think everything just starts with the data. If that's a good answer um, to that. No, that's a great answer. And I'm actually going to go throw the, through the question in a slightly different way based on what your answer is here, which is then how about for the companies that, and which I've definitely seen, unfortunately my fair share of, which is basically the solution is I'll just collect everything and hope that we'll eventually be able to make sense of that. Can you tell me some of the pros or pitfalls of that particular approach? Yeah. So I think, I mean, it's um, like a lot of people talk about like, the, it's like the data hoarding, right? It's like, you know, we'll, we'll collect it because, you know, I don't know if anybody ever watched like the old South Park, but there's this whole, there's an episode with like the underpants gnomes. I don't know if that's like safe to talk about, but it's like step one, collect underpants. Stay step there, two. but don't go from too much deeper. Go I think we're fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're um, fine. We're fine. Okay. Mainly it's like, we, we, we know that data has value. So if we collect everything, eventually we'll be able to go back and think of something to do with it. Um, but a lot of times it's like an expensive prospect to, you know, I'm like, <laughs> like prospecting like gold, but like the prospect itself is usually fit, it's like a false assumption, right? It's if I have data and I don't necessarily know what it is, eventually in the future, we can, you know, either, you know, throw machine learning at the problem to figure out what the data is. It's like, but really like the easier thing to do and like the cheaper thing to do is figure out what you want before you collect it versus collecting just everything. Otherwise, like it's like a monumental task. And it's usually like a very like thankless task to, you know, to go back through old data, attempting to try and find clues. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think it's much better to really kind of opt into what data you want to collect versus just taking everything. I mean, there's also like, there's a whole, whole sidebar discussion about, you know, GDPR and like data privacy, like don't collect everything without knowing what it is, because eventually it's going to come back to haunt you. Um, so, you know, think, think that whole entire process through so that, you know, you know, I don't know, it's like 10 years from now, your company doesn't get, you know, shut down for, you know, privacy issues and things like that. Um, so. Uh, no, that's a great call out. And in fact, I will probably wait till a little bit later on the decision-making phase to specifically talk about GDPR and privacy more in detail. But I do think it's important what you just called out right now, which is that even if you could theoretically afford from a fiscal perspective to just record everything, the fact that we have legal issues around CCPA, GDPR, privacy concerns, data breaches, all these other things, that you no longer can really afford to do that anyways. Uh, 
I would take you would probably believe agree with that statement. I, yes, I, I I agree with that. Perfect, perfect. Okay, well then let's shift over to like let's just say connecting the dots because you've talked about like like looking. Let's ask the right questions for what the data is, or like look look for some initial patterns to figure out whether we're collecting the right thing. How do we connect the dots? What are some key facets or points that you really need to call out for people who want to actually really connect the dots of the data that they actually have? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's like a, there's a segue to, you know, having, you know, having structure like in your data and having like, you know, a, you know, everyone, everyone talks about data catalogs, right? But, you know, having a, having a data catalog um, you know, it's kind of like back in the day, like I used to remember getting like the Sears catalog, which is like just, you know, showing my age and it would come for Christmas and there's a bunch of items in there and you can figure it out by category. You can figure it out, you know, by type, by price, et cetera. Um, it's easy to kind of locate what, you know, what you're looking for. And like, I think nowadays, like there's this notion where it's like, you know, we'd love to do the right thing. Everybody would always love to do the right thing, but a lot of times, you know, there's almost like, it's like, well, you know, this data is under the radar or, you know, this team owns that data, this team owns this data, you know, talk to them, you know, slack them, have a conversation about how to get it. But a lot of times it's like that leads to, you know, very kind of large lead times and to how people can actually collect and use data or even kind of collaborate with data. Um, if there's not like a, a single, you know, not a single location and or process for, you know, finding and locating and, you know, um, I'm like, I'm like annexing data is not the right word, but just like, I mean, I think it's just that, that process of knowing that something exists. Like, um, like I see this a lot with like different, like machine learning teams that I work with. It's like, you know, we need data for X, Y, and Z. And, you know, without saying what X, Y, and Z is like, you know, data, data powers models, data powers everything. But if you don't know where to look for it, then it's like, this kind of long road to just trying to get something out the door. It's like, you know, we have this idea, we have these expectations, but if we can't power it with data or we haven't collected the right data, like, or the data is also not trustworthy because it's, you know, it, I, the feeds stop, the data pipelines stop, you know, the data engineering team no longer exists. Like there's certain issues that, you know, can really stop something from running. You know, it's kind of like the California water crisis, right? It's like, you know, we'd love to have water, but we don't have any. So, you know, let's figure out something else. Like, you know, maybe we'll ship it in or something. I don't know. It's not a good analogy, but like, I think- data No, no, actually, you know, I've got a, a pretty good analogy that I like to use, if you don't mind, actually yeah, for you. Perfect. So, so for example, you know how we talk about this idea of like, oh, data catalogs or even data dictionaries. Actually, what I usually like to refer to is like, no, actually what you have is a data Dewey decimal system, okay? <laughs> or index cards. And so for all you young folk that may no longer remember this idea that you actually go to this massive set of little drawers where you pull out these little cards to go ahead and actually find the library, the, 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 the book that you need. <clears throat> the data that we're talking about exactly to uh, Scott's point, isn't just basically this gigantic, uh, uh, um, like but gigantic file system of just blah, right? What it really is, is that we actually need to organize and know what it is. And so in that essence, it's what your data is, it's more like a data library. Okay, and for more than anything else. Well, then how do we index and organize or, or figure out what exists is by actually in the library is the Dewey Decimal System. It's basically the index port. And in essence, that's what we sort of need too, because otherwise, exactly to your point, Scott, like we don't even know what data exists. And then how are we supposed to even analyze any of that stuff? Trial, trial by fire, right? It's like- Exactly, yes. I, I think it- yeah, I, I think it's like I think it's one of the things where um like I think like along this term, like along the kind of like the the journey of, you know, not even getting, I mean, we haven't talked about even building an evolutionary system or anything else yet. But like if you think about like what are the steps necessary to get started using data in general? Um, like a lot of times like it, you know, it depends on the size of the company, what you really need. Like, do you need to run everything in stream? Probably not. Do you need an effective way to ensure that data arrives? Probably. Um, and, you know, there's different ways of looking at, you know, problems like, do we want to collect, you know, all sensor data? Um, do we really only care about whether or not somebody has, you know, purchased an item in like an e-commerce, you know, situation? Um, what is it that we actually want to kind of track? Um, and is it also like, you know, is it non-creepy to, to track the things that we want to track as well? Like, you know, what is it that's, you know, best for the customer? Or what is it that, you know... I guess like uncreepy is like really just top of mind in general, just because of like, you know, privacy in general. Like I, I I love to know, I love to know like how my data, like how my personal data is being used in general. 
I also think it's great. Like I'll give like, I mean, I'm like, it's, I don't know. Anyways, I wear the Apple watch and all the stuff that works with health. There we go. It, I like, I like looking at health data. Um, I like being able to track like, you know, was I anxious or not anxious? Was I, did I sleep well or not? Like, how does that change and affect me? And so like, I'll give away my data to, you know, different applications that run a watch app just because I don't necessarily trust the companies that are collecting the data, but I like the results. And it's kind of like a weird thing where it's like, um, it's like that movie, what's uh, the circle, right? It's like, at, at what point are you, um, maybe that's not it. Um, it had like a Hermione Granger in it um, and like Tom Hanks back in the day. It's basically like, you know, in the future, we're tracking everything and everything's on camera, but because things are more transparent, yeah. we're better people for it. It's like, it was a kind of like an interesting, you know, study on like, you know, life and, um, you know, supervision and opt. I don't know. Um, I guess uh, it's like the, the, I don't know, it's like the eagle eye, big brother, et cetera, right? It's like, um, at what point are you willing to, you know, opt into, you know, less privacy in, in order to, you know, for the better good of things? And that's a tangent. Um, well, I'm going to go back on track. No, that's okay. I, it's a fact, actually, uh, the circle, I just completely forgot about the movie. So my, my apologies for that. But then, okay. So right now, up to this point, just exactly like you called out, is that we, we're just still, we haven't even talked about evolution yet. We're still talking about what is the data we have and what we're gonna, how are we gonna index or make sense of it? Okay, the, what was implied, but not actually called out, which actually is part of that evolutionary process now that we're gonna jump into this is data lineage. And what I mean by that is that don't forget, when you're taking all the pieces of data that you're trying to process, right? The reality is, data is gonna get joined with other data and then there's new data that's gonna be created. And so there's a lineage of understanding what whatever happened to something upstream is going to invariably impact a system downstream, right? And so because that's actually the real problem, how do you handle things? Like how do you have, what's the framework? Forget about the technology for this second. What's the framework or mindset that you have for things like lineage? I'm curious. Yeah. So I think, I mean, if you think about like, I think if you think about lineage, just as like, you know, think about like a Google maps, right. Or, you know, um, you know, some kind of generic maps application. Um, let's, let's, I don't know, like I can't even remember the old app that I used to use. Um, but anyways, like if you think about like, you know, waypoints in a journey, right. You know, you start somewhere with data, you collect it, it moves along, you know, potentially like, you know, a route that changes significantly over time. And at the end, at the end of the day, like there's something that you need to continuously rely on, like in terms of like, you know, the output at an egress point and at what egress point. Cause a lot of times, like if you think about like, you know, a traditional data pipeline, for example, like, you know, it, it was, you know, let's put stuff in like a data warehouse and that's going to be kind of like the end of the journey. But I think nowadays, like there's like this whole notion of like, you know, you think about like data meshes and fabrics and all this other stuff, or if you think about like, you know, how streaming data has kind of evolved over time with, you know, all the streaming platforms that are out, all the different ways of, you know, collecting that. Um, th there's this notion of being able to kind of like, you know, adaptively change like a DAG um, or like a, you know, directed graph of data that's moving over time. So you might be experimenting, you know, if you think about like the same way that you canary applications, you know, how do you canary or experiment with data? Um, you know, there's many, like there's different ways to approach that. Um, and there's like, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a hundred thousand ways to do everything. Um, so it can be done like, you know, if you take a step back from like, you know, data systems that, you know, are being used to just, you know, kind of collect and like, you know, mash data together, um, you know, for a lack of elegance and like, you know, in that term, right. We're joining data over many different, you know, tables. Um, but the problem I think with a lot of like the lineage is that like some data doesn't ever arrive, right. Some data is gone. And it's like, you know, I, I think it's, there's this, problem with not, you know, it's, I don't know. <laughs> just, anyways, I was going to talk about like absentee fathers or something, but um, if you think of, sorry, just anyways, moving on. Um, there's, there's this whole notion where it's like, you know, who, who's, who's basically responsible for data. I think data lineage kind of starts off with this notion that there is somebody who's producing data, the person or entity, wh whoever's doing it. Right now, I think there's a lot of teams where it's, you know, there's a team providing data and producing data. That data has a frequency. Like how often are we, you know, collecting from IoT sensors? You know, what's that interval of time where we're creating new data? But then also data has different time intervals. There's different times where things need to kind of line up. 
which usually never works in the like in practice. In theory, it's like, you know, here's a complex DAG and everything's going to always land on time. We're going to give everything about, you know, a two minute wait time. And, you know, we expect everything within like 10 minutes or something like that. Like in reality, like, you know, it's wishful thinking for a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, the lineage itself, like just knowing like, what was my upstream, if nothing else, you know, what's kind of like, you know, a partial graph of my data. Do I trust my upstream to produce data that I'm expecting to have? Um, and I think that this is a longer conversation as well. Um, it can be done through tables. It can be done through, you know, structured data, um, you know, different, you know, Avro, Protobuf, different libraries it can be done with parquet schemas. Right. But so the key context though, is that even though the techniques may be very different, uh, depending on the environment you're in, what has to be solved still is going to be the same irrelevant of which tech you use, right? So there are issues about being, as you implied with the DAGs, right? What is the data change frequency? What is the change in the order of which the these particular tasks need to do? Uh, what are the governance aspects that go with it? And most importantly, how to deal with failures, right? So why don't we talk a little bit about these aspects, whether it's the change yeah. frequency, the governance or the failures actually. Yeah, so I think like, I think if you think about like the change frequency, um, like there's many, I'm like, I, I always like, it's like, I like to say like data comes in all shapes and sizes. You know, here's a general, here's a generalism. Um, but certain data changes a lot more often than other data points. Like if you think about like, you know, um, a more mature company that has very specific, you know, table structures for their data, chances are it probably hasn't changed in a while. Like, you know, you might be adding, you know, uh, you know, a new foreign key that's representing a new, you know, a new table, maybe. But a lot of times, like that data changes infrequently, like especially if it's, you know, something representing like, you know, a stable product. Um, but then there's also data where it's just message passing, like between, you know, many systems. And for a lot of stuff now where it's like, you know, I need to understand, you know, say for logistics, for example, like I need to understand where all my trucks are in the United States at all given points in time, who the drivers are. And I also want like the, the consumer to know that, you know, they're number eight on the delivery schedule. And by the way, you can literally drive and follow the truck. Like there's a lot of like those different, like, you know, it's like on track. I think I can't remember the name of the company now, but um, I, it's, it's interesting, like the kind of eyes and ears we have, like in these, two, into these different systems, but like being able to kind of get to the point where you, you know, you have the ability to kind of monitor everything at the same time. It's just a different kind of problem. Like, you know, one's kind of time-based, you know, it's more, you know, I care, you know, I care about how this geo position is changing over time. It's kind of a different, um, it's a different thing that you're solving for. So I think like kind of a lot of this ends up going back to like, what is it that you're capturing data for? And um, all of that stuff's going to kind of propagate through your, through your system um, in general. Right. And then I think the implication is that because we're talking about evolutionary systems, what you're collecting and the reasons you're collecting are going to change over time as well, which is why that's tied to your lineage and data change frequency, just because of the fact that if your system is a remotely usable <laughs> and actually being used by people, it will invariably need to change to accommodate new metrics, new data, new or anything else. Yep. Right. But then I guess the question is that knowing these things and knowing that you do actually have to care about these things and be and build the engineering processes or engineering rigor to do that. How do you deal with the fact that in reality, the vast majority of the time, you have to prepare for data failures, whether it's failure in processing, failure with the data that is not in the expected format or whatever else for that matter, that, that, that failures, it, like let's, let's, let's just harp on that just for a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, if you think about like any, so any system will fail, given enough time, like given enough uptime, it will fail. Um, it's, you know, it's a general, a general rule of thumb. I think with data, like failures can be a lot more catastrophic depending on, you know, the, you know, the fragility, I guess is the right word. Like if you have a fragile system that's, you know, expecting, it's always expecting a specific event. And if the specific event never arrives, then you have memory leaks because you're waiting for one event to push data out of the system, for example. Um, I, I think doing game days, like in general is something that, you know, is kind of like an older kind of DevOps type of, you know, strategy. It's like, what happens if, you know, say, say Netflix is chaos monkey, for example, what happens when we turn off Cassandra nodes at random? Like what happens next? 
you know, do we, you know, what's the time, like, what's the, you know, mean time to recovery, like MTTR? Um, how do you track that? Like also on a data point, like for, for data, like data is, data is very complex in general. Like when you start thinking about like these, you know, these DAG chains that might have like a hundred, hundred basically levels of it kind of indirection, or it's really just like a, a graph of data that's, you know, moving through a system over time, like pinpointing that, like there's a lot of like, there's a, you know, there's a lot of movement now, like towards like, you know, data observability and being able to, you know, track via metrics, like, you know, what's the completeness of like my data? Like, you know, if I expect to have a specific, you know, data format in general, because that's like the expectation, you know, that's my data contract with like my upstream. Um, so let's say upstream, just because upstream can be an API and upstream can be like a Kafka topic. It can be, you know, Pulsar, it doesn't really matter. It's some sort of data source that has, you know, I trusted that the data source is not gonna let me down. And now it has for some reason whatsoever. Like being able to, you know, test that and actually know like, what, what is it that I'm, you know, what is it that I actually really do expect? Like there's a lot of systems where it's kind of like fire and forget. It's like, okay, like we did our, we did our job. You know, we sent some abstract, you know, map of any, any, like for, you know, people who, under, you know, from the Java world, like here's something that's unrecognizable. You figure it out later. Like there's, there's not much you can do, right? Like, it's like, this could be anything. I really hope for the best in the future. You can't really test for failure because like there's not really much to test, like, or it's really expensive to test. But then there's also different things if you think about like, you know, Confluence registry, like you have a specific, you know, specific like one or more, you know, schemas that are structured, it could be Avro, Protobuf, et cetera. I don't know if they have more than that now, but it's tied to your topic. So you have kind of like this, you know, you have a channel for emitting data of a specific type. And, you know, you can validate literally at like the ingress point, you know, via, you know, the confluence registry or con I don't know how a lot of this stuff works. Um, you know, there's many different ways of doing it. Um, you can also do the, th the same stuff like through like API gateways or, you know, depending on like what it is that you need to do, um, you know, validating that your data that is, you know, the, I guess like the lifeblood for your company, et cetera, like that sounds kind of cheesy to say it, but like for data that you don't want to fail, a lot of times like that's something that can be solved more easily, you know, by, you know, having a binding contract. This is our version of this schema for this release of our, you know, API server. That's what's generating our data. That's what's going to flow into the system. If I'm sending invalid data, it's easier to basically send back like a 400 to, you know, a service. This is like, you know, for the rest days or whatever else. Like, it's like, here's an error. Please go fix yourself. Like this canary is bad. Like you're going to lose some data, but it's a lot easier to lose data like in like you know a partial you know a one percent canary release than it would be to be like well we turned it on to 100 percent now all of our data is gone it's like well that's a lot harder to fix and it's a lot harder to fix once it's entered into like as i hit my microphone as it as it enters into like a streaming network in general um so you know how do you fix it at the edge like the edge is important if you think about like you know this being like the transition point or the handoff point you know say you know it's a carrier network it's you know whatever it is there's an agreement and we don't want people to let other people down. So, you know, fix it at the source. Um, and I, I think with that, like it's, if you have guarantees about, you know, I guess if you have confidence in like the, the data that's going to be received through your network, it helps with failure a lot more because you know what to test for. It's like, well, here's, you know, here's the stop gaps that we have in our system. You know, say it's a gRPC server that has a, sp you know, specific protobuf. And that's going to be basically, there's no other way of sending data. So the only thing that could be incorrect is whether or not, you know, people potentially break backwards compatibility with a, with a release. Um, that could change and kill everything, but it's a lot harder if people are following best practices than if you're, you know, sending, you know, a random kind of JSON blob that might change depending on release or which server is running or like, you know, a lot of things that like, you know, I, I, I can be blamed for that back in like the day as well. Like, it's like, oh, like it's much easier this will be a lot less effort. Like we'll, we're just going to literally send anything. Um, but you know, as as you kind of mature, like with your data operations, you a lot of times it's like you move more towards like, well, you can move fast and break fast, but it's really bad if you break the you know the eyes and ears of like you know the systems the company depends on. So being able to kind of take more time and making sure that like the upfront process is there. Like I think you were talking, Denny, before about that. Like you know, how is it that you make this something that is you know. I don't know, it's like widely known best practices for, you know, data teams or people producing data within like the company. And if you have, you know, best practices to follow or, you know, even, you know, even low code systems or other things like that, that make it easier then a lot of times like people will just, you know, adopt 
you know, what's, what's available. Right, exactly. And I think the, the, the key call out when it comes to those best practices, as you're saying, is the fact that, and you actually called that out, which is this concept of a contract. Like if we go back to exactly the, re, the whole premise of REST API services, right? The whole premise of us saying we use REST API to send data in bulk itself has its own set of problems, right? Because it's a very extremely chatty systems. Um, we end up saturating the network. It's a lot of fun. And I'm being very facetious for obvious reasons. But Oh, sure. Let's go with that. Let's fine. Right. By the same token, right. It, 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 the whole premise of this, of us talking about in terms of REST APIs was this idea of a contract, right. As in like, as in when you send, if you send this correctly formed <laughs> message, we will return to you this correctly formed response in this for particular format, you know, whether you're talking about protobuf or parquet or whatever else, but it'll be in that, or JSON, excuse me, and they'll be in that correct form for you to then to digest. And then the likelihood of it failing, assuming you follow best practice, like when you add new columns, you will have new versions. So that way that you be tied to a particular version, you will less likely to fail, but that's the whole point of the building up that contract. And so even though we sound like we're a bunch of lawyers now, because we keep on using the word contract, that's actually the most important aspect of scaling, right? This idea that as you evolve, there are contracts made between teams right down at the API level. So the different teams that are interacting with each other can interact at that contract level. So they know exactly what is being expected from them and for their input and what the expected output is going to look like. Yeah, I think that was, I think, I think that's a really, that's a succinct way of kind of encapsulating like the whole I guess like that, like, like the last like 10 minutes of me blab you know, blabbering. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, think, I think it's just like, I, I think in general, like it's, I think it's, it's, it's like kind of like, it's like of like the utmost importance, I think for, you know, for you, you, you know, we talked about like the data, like data lineage itself, like before you even begin to even think about what, you know, what is it, what, it, how is data mutating over time? Um, more like more than that, it's like, well, you know, should, should data mutate? outside of like the scope of what we need. Like, you know, you think about, you know, think about SQL, right? You can project and you can select data and you can create what you want out of it. Same kind of thing with like GraphQL, but behind everything, there's always this like very solid structure. You know, here's the table format. I'm not gonna randomly just, you know, like we can't like with SQL tables, like we can't go and say like, you know what, forget it. We're gonna, this column's out of here. It's like, you, I hate you, you're out of here. It's like, you can kind of deprecate it and you can, you know, you can do things over time you can, you know, even, you know, start writing two different tables and slowly kind of deprecate an entire table. But a lot of times you're stuck in that base contract, depending on who's using it. You can't necessarily, you know, I don't know, you, you, you can't break that, you know, break that trust in general. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things I think that were kind of baked into early like SQL systems that, you know, I don't know, I think back to like lineage of like, you know, other data evolutions, right? It's like, you know, moving from, you know, fully structured, you know, SQL, moving into no SQL, it could be anything, you know, it's a document store, you know, there's pros and cons, like you can literally put anything in a document store and you can, you know, you can literally massively scale it horizontally. And, you know, you're really not having to worry about like the same kind of, you know, separation of concerns with like a traditional like, like OLTP system or, you know, a regular kind of like old fashioned traditional like database. Um, but, you know, there's pros and cons to that because a document can be anything and it can always be anything. And I think I remember like back in the day, like, you know, it's like, oh, like, uh, I was at a, uh, Silicon Valley has this meetup group. Uh, I don't know if it's still in existence. It was called the cloud computing meetup group. And um, I remember like sitting back at like Carnegie Mellon, this is, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And it's like, you know, here's like a uh, React database, Tokyo DB, here's uh, Redis, and then here's like Cassandra. Um, and it's like, you know, here's different kind of flavors of like NoSQL pros and cons for everything. And I remember like being like, oh man, this is awesome. Like, I hate schemas. Like schemas are terrible. Like this oh, is- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This it was hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, I hate those things. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, so I, I don't know. I think like, as like, as things kind of change over time, like there's always like this, you know, you kind of fall back. Like, I feel like it's like me getting old, but it's like, you know, I, I'm, I need something that's structured. It's like, you know, I- you know, Oh, no, I, no, no, no. Actually, I'm going to interrupt you slightly, but only because I know exactly what you're talking about. So- <laughs> In this case, for example, I came from the SQL Server team myself at Microsoft, right? So very much structured, you know, the structure, 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 structure. You, know, you, you have to do it exactly to find all the, all the advantage of structure. We couldn't scale for the life of us, but we could certainly, you know, we could scale on a you know, single single box, of course, we could do that. Uh, we, even with Numa nodes, yeah, I'm bringing that back. But the, the context is like, you know, this idea of distributed horizontal scalability, now forget that, that's not gonna happen because, well, we're just gonna do it. And so then, then, 
I was on the team that brought in what is now known as HD Insight, i.e. Hadoop on Azure and Windows. It's because we're saying, nah, forget it. We don't need schema. Schema on rate. That's a solution to everything. And the NoSQL databases were coming at the same time. So yeah, we just need document source. We never need the schema. We never need the schema. And then, so that's the V2 version of the data world. And right now we're in the V3. And then at the risk of sounding like I'm a marketing guy, like where I use terms like lake house, it's actually active, right? From the standpoint of saying, look, the problem is that we actually want the flexibility of these like NoSQL worlds or these data lakes, but we still need the reliability and enforcement of some type. So that way the data that comes in, actually we can track it, have linked to it as some form of governance. And so then this is the V3 world, i.e. the lake house world. This is where we actually have to combine those two concepts together. So in other words, you can have structure with contracts, yet also scalability and flexibility at the exact same time. Yeah. Yeah, I think I yeah, that's I think that's that's totally accurate. I think, you know, if I think the other thing too that like Lake House and like other like kind of like the new like emerging architectures, like, you know, you know, I, I think about like, you know. We had no SQL. We had SQL. We had new SQL, and it's like, oh man, like this is you know this is great. Like, what is new SQL? It's like, well, it's you know horizontally scalable, and like you know we throw cluster scale to make you know replication. You know, replication basically takes care of you know the fact that we're not going to have like a you know a vertically scaling node. Um, but you know, it comes at you know issues with cap theorem. Like, there's issues with latency. There's issues with like you know um, you know partition unawareness like it's like well you know i don't know where grandpa went like it's okay like um it's you know some of those things where it's like you know i don't know sorry about that um but it's you know all good you, man all good yeah how, how do you how do you basically architect for failure kind of going back really back to like that whole entire failure issue and you know do things still work like you know that was kind of like the early like map reduced you know programming model it was like you know we expect failure we expect nodes to go down like let's just replicate a bunch and you know we can just you know we can throw the whole entire cluster at the problem, and you know then you know other revolutions come from there, right? It's like you know well this really works well, but you know how do we how do we you know how do we add caching and iteration to all of this, and you know how do things kind of grow up from there? And I think now like going back to, you know that kind of you know it's like choose your own adventure. Like do you want structure? Do you want speed? What's the trade off you're willing to make? Like with your actual data sources? Like I think most people you know eventually love consistency, right? It's like, oh, there's a jo long joke about eventual consistency there. But like, I, I would much rather like, I would much rather know exactly what data I have, when it lands where, and that's a hard problem to solve. Like data lineage is difficult, especially when you have, you know, it's like the whole microservices type architecture, right? It's like, well, we went from a monolith to a bazillion different microservices. Right. Now everyone has their own opinion of what data looks like. And how do we converge on something that allows us to, you know, connect and read all this data? But how do we still make sure that it works? Like, you know, right? Okay, that gets harder, right? It's like how okay. do you, you want to micromanage, right? Absolutely. So, okay, now let me let me wrap this up, so that way we can at least for the remaining like five seven minutes talk about the road to actionable uh, data. So one of the things that we sort of skipped, but we actually did call out all throughout the conversation so far is about the, the methods for looking at the data. We talked about ad hoc versus batch streaming, and we didn't talk about beyond, but only because we, we probably spent too much time talking about quantum computing. So let's not do that discussion now, okay? Um, but but let it, let's definitely talk about that road to actionable data because we've actually been sort of harping on this in terms of the word contract and, and, and observability for that matter, which in this case, we're talking about SLAs, right? We're talking about data ops or ML ops. So let's talk a little bit about those. How do you, how do we put this all together? Now you, we've talked about the structure. We've talked about all these other things and we've talked about contracts. So like, how do you, how do we go ahead and actually now allow us to act on this data so that way we can involve our data systems while we're at it? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you think about, if you think about everything is like, you know, I guess like right now we've talked sort of through like a four, like a four step process. I mean, we've, we've hand waved through a four step process. Like there's a lot more like involved in like the nitty gritty to make everything work. But I think like, like at the very end of, you know, at the end of the road, right. It's like, well, we've, you know, we've come, we've come to the conclude, like the close of this journey. And now we have this data that's, you know, available for processing. Like the question comes up of like, well, what's the, you know, how often do you want to process and what, you know, what strategy do you take? And this is like a whole tangent, which would take us till 4 p.m. or, you know, whatever, whenever people read this, you know, or not read this, that's anyways, when they view it later. But um, there's this whole notion of like time, right? It's like, 
you know, how often do I care about this data? So I think Gita brought that up really well with like the whole entire idea of inference caching. Like how often does my data change? Like, do I care if it changes? Like there's a lot of stuff where it's like, you can't even cache it because it will never ever be cacheable. Um, and there's other things it can be. Um, so I think like if you like if you think about what it is that you are doing with your data, what's the end result of what it is that you're trying to accomplish, that's then what you're kind of architecting for anyways. So you know, is this point in time snapshot? You know, am I doing reporting on this data? Um, do I care whether or not you know? Do I care about you know minute level you know um, granularity? Do I care about how things are changing hourly, daily? Sometimes I might only care about whether or not customers say are churning every seven days, um, maybe monthly. I think like the way that you look at the data changes the way that you know you're going to build the system anyways. So regardless of all of that stuff, I think it's kind of tangential. But um, if you want to basically take your data and do something with it, um, you have different ways of you know querying your data. So do you want to use you know are you using sql are you connecting this through like you know jdbc to you know tableau or some other you know internal you know metric store or something else like what is it that you're doing i think is like kind of coming back like i think we started there like what is it that your data is capturing we're kind of ending there as well cuz like when you know what you want to capture that's right that's right you've it you've collected it you've gone through all the heavy work like i know like we got, you know we glanced over like throw monitoring in there right like data <laughs> monitoring like does it work does it not work Am I missing data? What's the latency? Um, I think it was, I think it was Airbnb. They created like, um, they had like their streaming data visualization tool um, that they were showing that there's a Medium post about it. I can't remember. Um, so I apologize if I just screwed that up and it's somebody else, but they had this idea of like, you know, what's the operational latency of specific, you know, data tables, for example, and being able to know whether or not like the SLAs have changed. So you brought up SLAs before, like, what are my service level agreements? Like, what are the indicators? Like, how am I actually capturing the data and seeing, you know, seeing how things change? Um, regardless of all that stuff, like, you know, it's basically DevOps like 101, like type in, you know, information, like, you know, SRE type information. Like, but if you think about all of that, just in general, let's roll it all up into like this, you know, huge bin of stuff and forget about it and move on to the next step. Once everything else is actually working and you have data available, um, then, you know, again, we glance over data governance and like PII and who's using what, where and all of that other stuff. But um, if you want to basically, you know, make things that are actionable, a lot of times it's literally just connecting to something. So are you connecting back to an API? Are you throwing this stuff back right. down to Kafka? Um, what is it that you want to do? And again, it goes back to that whole entire question, which, you know, you can kind of leave as open-ended, but there's ways of connecting back to your data. And there's many ways of doing that nowadays. Um, you know, basically it's like, you know, choose your poison, right? It's like, you know, how do you want to do this? And, you know, is this, you know, are you connecting in a way that will, you know, is future proof as well? Perfect. So I wanted to go, Scott did not ask me to do this, by the way, I did this on a, out of my own uh, version. Scott actually happens to be the author of an upcoming book called Modern Data Engineering with Apache Spark, a hands-on guide for building permission critical streaming applications. And so I went ahead and actually popped it into LinkedIn, to YouTube and, uh, and, uh, and to um, the Zoom here. But the reason I'm calling this out is because exactly to Scott's point, you know, Scott and I have a, always a great time chatting with each other. So the fact is we probably would do it even if there's only, no, <laughs> if there wasn't a major event, we would just have this conversation anyways. It could just but be the, two of us. Yeah, actually for that matter, it probably is just the two of us. But the thing is that irrelevant of that, the, the real key call out that I want to sort of make is that Scott has a ton of experience when it comes to building these systems. And, and when we want to go deeper into the various concepts we've talked about here, whether it comes to lineage or contracts or anything else, a lot of these concepts actually are, in fact, covered uh, much more in depth in his upcoming book. So I, I do think it would be a really great idea for y'all to go ahead and check that out. So I just want to give you a, a quick shout out. If I hope that's okay. No, that's perfect. Um, th thank you for the free marketing, right? The, hey, I, I gotta be worth it a little bit. I gotta be helpful sometimes. Right? <laughs> perfect. Well, then I think this has been a fun conversation, like always, Scott. I'm gonna switch it back to Karen to close this up. But like always, uh, any questions? Uh, the other place you can always check uh, Scott and me out. We're both basically uh, hanging out on the on the Delta user Slack channel and all that stuff anyway. So you can always just ping us there. <laughs> Thanks, Sunny. Yeah, and I'm sure you'll have uh, some upcoming sessions continuing this conversation in the future, which no, I'm sure we, 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 would to. <laughs> we would never do that. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott, uh, for your time. It was great having you uh, for this meetup. And um, thank you, Gita, too. She had to run. Uh, but And thank you, everyone, for joining. So uh, again, this recording is available on YouTube. So check out our YouTube channel. And I know Denny and Gita uh, posted a bunch of links to their materials. So I'll go ahead and update the, the YouTube description with um, those links. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and uh, take care. Thanks. Bye.